Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Chilling Rain, make sure you go ahead and check out the Town store. You can get a 5% discount on your order using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, me and Jack have been inspired by the upcoming 25th anniversary set, as they have announced that they are going to be adding 25 of the most iconic Pokemon cards of all time into a set where we're going to get very close reprints of the cards. So far announced, we know that we're getting a base set Charizard, an Umbreon Gold Star, and a Pikachu from base set, but we wanted to go over the history of Pokemon and really break down these categories to really some nominees of what we think could be the most iconic in all of these different categories. So let's jump in, starting off with Dark Pokemon, and we'll be moving our way through chronologically uh, for these sets release. Yeah, so kicking off with Dark Pokemon, we actually saw Dark Pokemon in a variety of different ways. Uh, in the Gen 1 era, you can see we've picked uh, a few nominees, plus Dark Blastoise, which is going to be our winner. We both love the art on Dark Blastoise, plus Blastoise is a fan favourite anyway. Uh, but also, it was pretty close because there was some Dark Pokemon printed uh, in Team Rocket Returns as well, kind of a throwback to when they were first printed in the Rocket set. Um, and we also think Dark Dragonite is a very, very, very good nominee. Fantastic art, a beautiful card, especially in that reverse holo print where the actual uh, picture is a holographic. Uh, but yeah, this is kind of the layout of the slides. We're going to have some of our nominees on the side and then our winner uh, off to the right. Uh, and yeah, for Dark Pokemon, it's going to be Dark Blastoise, like I said. Just look at that art. I think, um, <laughs> y you know, it's just, it, it is pretty iconic. All of these have been primarily thought about competitive in, in a competitive sense with... Uh, some sort of collecting purposes and thoughts thrown in there as well as our personal opinions on, you know, particular cards we really like. And Dark Plastus, I think, takes the cake for both of us. Yeah, I think there are times when some of these categories are going to naturally have, like, collector-driven based ones. Some will be quite mixed. Like, this one is fairly mixed. There's a mixture of some playable stuff in here from the, the good old days. And there's some things that sort of override that where it's a popular species, it's a popular artwork, it's iconic in its own right. So... Overall, we're just going for iconic in general. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on to the light counterparts then from the Neo Destiny set. We think Light Arcanine really encapsulates that. It's just too good of a collector card to not have. There wasn't that many playable light Pokemon in general, so this is more on the collecting front. I think Light Dragonite, probably the most playable of the light uh, Pokemon back in the day, but even then, it was kind of niche, kind of fringe. There weren't even that many holographic Pokemon uh, in the light category. I think there's only Azumarill and Togetic as well here. So we've got yeah. some common and uncommons going on. Uh, it would actually be really nice, and one of my little wish list kind of things would be if they gave holographic uh, patterns to common and uncommon cards. Like, if we got that Wigglytuff in a holographic, I would be astonished, and I think it would look lovely. But I yeah. think in general, Arcanine is just too good to pass up right now. Definitely. Next up, we have Trainers Pokemon. Now, obviously, uh, early on, this is kind, this was kind of the very uh, first way we saw, at, like, sort of the anime and the games tied into uh, the TCG, where we saw characters... Uh, from these owning their Pokemon. Uh, Rocket Zapdos was by far our winner here. The art, again, is absolutely iconic. The hollow foil on this card is uh, brilliant. And it's a Rockets card. It's not even a Gym Leaders card. It's, uh, you know, owned by the big bad team of the first gen, which is amazing. Uh, but there's some there's some more iconic cards on the screen. Uh, Blaine's Moltres and Arcanine are two of my personal favourites, uh, especially from the Gen 1 era, where I really wasn't collecting. So being able to go back and look at some of the uh, older cards... Blaine's Arcanine and Blaine's Moltres always stand out to me. Um, but even even things, we've got uh, Erica's Jigglypuff, which may, on the surface, not look particularly exciting. But again, all of these arts are just so, so uh, iconic. And, they you, you know, we don't see arts like this anymore. So all of these cards really stand out uh, nowadays. Uh, but yeah, Rocket Zapdos was our pick for the best or most iconic trainers Pokemon that we'd like to see in the reprint set. Next up, we have Shining Pokemon. And uh, Shining Gyarados is by far, I think, the coolest of the Shinings. Obviously, we got it in uh, Neo Revelation with a ton from Neo Destiny as well. But the Shining Gyarados from the video games is just such an iconic uh, Pokemon. It's a great uh, storyline that we have going on there. You see a fisherman just <laughs> completely terrified by what he's seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it tells a great story and it's just an awesome looking card overall. So, yeah, Shining Gyarados is going to be the winner for the Shining Pokemon category. I think these were some of the first secret rares as well, right? This I, th yeah. I think there was too many secret rares in the early. So yeah, another iconic for another reason as well. This is one of the first ever uh, cards outside of its uh, outside of the normal numbering system, which is really cool. Yeah, and, and uh, higher rarity than just regular uh, yeah. one in three. 
Next up, we have Crystal Pokemon. Crystals were another higher rarity, and you can see there are only like nine or ten of these to pick from, but all all of these, I think pretty much all of the crystals look amazing. Um, you know, the hollow foil on them is beautiful. The colors are so vibrant. They have uh, these this really interesting mechanic in the crystal type. Um, Lugia was our pick, though. Uh, we tried to uh, steer clear from overlapping species where we could, but there were there are a couple of instances where it uh, was always going to happen. Um, and Lugia is one of those species. There's another Lugia on this list you'll see a little bit later on. Uh, but this one is, yeah, definitely one of the best crystals out there. It's You can see just from this photo uh, how much hollow foil there actually is on this card. Um, and yeah, it's so it's so sparkly and the ho uh, sorry the Lugia really stands out compared to the background. Uh, but yeah, I think most of these could have been very yeah. uh, very viable for the iconic slot. They just look at them; they are some of the best cards artwork wise I think yeah. ever printed. And none of them were playable, so this was purely on looks. <laughs> <laughs> On to Aqua Magma Pokemon. This is kind of a very small category. Obviously, this is only in the Team Aqua Team Magma set, but we do have some future categories where it'll make more sense why we've added these guys in. Uh, but I think there's a clear winner here. Uh, Team Magma's Groudon was the poster boy of the Team Magma deck that did so well in the first ever um, Nintendo Pokemon Worlds. Uh, as they pass over from Wizards of the Coast. So the first ever world's winning card deck was built around Groudon, Claydol, Camerupt, but Groudon was obviously the main attacker. So I think he is going to be naturally the winner here. Uh, maybe if they are trying to get some duality in there, they throw in a Kyogre just to go alongside it. Uh, but yeah, a really cool um, dual type Pokemon being introduced uh, that had some really specific synergies and mechanics and really stepped the game in a different direction uh, into the future of the Pokemon TCG. So really cool uh, winner of this Aqua Magma category. No. Next up, we have the Small EXs from the uh, third generation. Uh, Lugia again was our pick. This is the second Lugia on the list. Uh, of course, this I think I think this is one of the most iconic cards of all time. In yeah. all honesty, it's it was good competitively, but also it is just a great art. It's I, I think a lot of the X Pokemon uh, the EX Pokemon did suffer a little bit on the art, uh, art, art side of things. Just the shadows on a lot of these cards are a bit sort of hard to see. Um, but I think this Lugia is just known by pretty much every Pokemon player that's ever played. It was competitive. It was it, It's a legendary Pokemon at the time. There were only three, uh, three generations, so legendaries were uh, definitely fewer and further between. Um, and yeah, just a fantastic card. There are some. There were some really close nominations, though. I think personally, the Mew is another favorite. I think yeah. uh, again, it's just so simple. But the contrast between the green and the purple and pinks and all, like all over that card is just again really, really nice. So uh, yeah, very, very tough choice. But Lugia did squeak ahead. Next up, we have Gold Star Pokemon. Not many of these were super playable. Every now and then, you'd see one weaved in. Um, but the Rayquaza Gold Star again. It's the thing that you think of straight away when you see a Rayquaza. Uh, this was relatively playable. This was added into some archetypes that had that energy acceleration to fall back on. Um, and just look at it. I mean, it is an incredible artwork, Rayquaza. Mm -hmm. One of the most iconic Pokemon. Uh, one of the most beloved Pokemon uh, across all of the generations, let alone Gen 3. But this really uh, encompasses Gold Stars altogether. Just an excellent looking card and uh, did have some playability as well. Yeah. Next up, we have Delta Species. Now, Delta Species spanned a few different sets, um, and you may have seen a couple on a couple of our slides so far, but this is just purely Delta Species Pokemon. We went with Metagross. I think the art is fantastic. I think the card was, well, I know the card was very, very playable. It was, you know, a fantastic archetype of its time. Uh, but also the Delta mechanic in general is a really, really interesting one, and I think uh, Delta Metagross kind of really fits the bill. There's, it's multiple types. Some of the Delta Pokemon were just one type, but this was a multi-type Delta Pokemon. It had Delta-based effects. It wasn't just kind of a Delta Pokemon that didn't really do too much Delta-based stuff. It was just a different type. Um, and yeah, I think it, it really, really fits the bill. Metagross, another fan favorite, of course. Uh, so yeah, definitely a really, really deserving winner, we thought. But you can see just the quality of Delta Pokemon on this slide. Dragonite, Kingdra, Flygon, all... Uh, essentially pseudo legendaries um, or very very strong Pokemon and hugely fan favorite. All of the arts for Delta Pokemon looked insane. The way the hollow foil was on them as well. Uh, I think. Well, we know they are aware of the Delta mechanic because they're releasing the Delta Mimikyu. So hopefully we will see a Delta come uh, in the set as well, uh, and it would be really cool to see one of these. I think. 
Yeah, and the icing on the cake would actually be if they did it in reverse form. I think that would look a little bit more cool where you yeah, have a sure. set logo in there, you get the gold text. They just look even better in that style. Definitely. We move on to the Diamond and Pearl era with level X Pokemon. This is a pretty tricky one to narrow down just to five picks because there have been so many playable uh, level Xs over the span of the Diamond and Pearl and Platinum series. Um, but we've gone with Gardevoir level X, pretty much the cherry on top, to be honest. The very, very playable archetype that just wouldn't go away for so many years. You know, since its release, it was one of the top archetypes and it carried on grinding its way through every single metagame, finding a way uh, through thick and thin just because the regular Gardevoir telepass is such an incredible ability and stopping your opponent from using their own powers was also very, very good. So uh, Gardevoir is really the icing on the cake for this sort of uh, archetype and it also has the looks on its side. I think Flygon potentially uh, arguably is one of my favorite artworks of this sort of era, but the Gardevoir was just that much more playable. We had to give it the nod in the end. Next up, we have SP Pokemon. You may have been wondering why Luxray Geo Level X wasn't I win over the Level Xs. That's because we separated SP Pokemon out because uh, Luxray is, was just one of the most insane cards of all time. Bright Look at the time was literally meta-defining. The SP engine in general completely changed the meta game. Uh, it was sort of the first time we saw uh, big basics in the form of evolved Pokemon um, be super competitive, which was cool. Uh, the whole SP engine was the first, like, Apart from like Magma Aqua engines, it was the first time we'd seen that engine for I think four or five years. Uh, so it kind of got a facelift, and the cards were insane. Uh, you know, Luxury alone was bonkers, but Gar all four of these cards, particularly I think Garchomp, was a very deserving yeah. runner-up. Um, Garchomp, I think, is heralded as one of the best attackers of all time for its time. Obviously, it doesn't compare to some of the stats of these days, but at the time. Uh, it was just absolutely bonkers. It was both of these cards were meta defining, uh, but Luxray came out all that just that little bit earlier, and I think probably saw overall more CP if we were in a CP style era. So it slightly wins out just there. Uh, but yeah, you can you can tell this was an insanely hard category to uh, break down just because of the quality of the cards uh, in the SP era. Next up, we have Prime Pokemon. Moving on to the Heart Gold Soul Silver series and again a really really hard fought category turns out so many of the prime pokemon ended up being playable in one era or another uh just very very solid statted cards always with like good poker powers on there as well or bodies uh we've gone for magnezone just because he was mostly the backbone of all sorts of different creations you know uh he would make any sort of funky archetype work you could even play a 101 line of magnezone and no one would bat an eyelid just because when you got it into play it milked so much value just such a ridiculous card shout out to gengar because there is that sort of harping to the lost zone another new mechanic in the tcg so you can also see a reason for why they may go down that route uh also gengar's a kind of popular species out there and has some good artwork mm -hmm. on his side but in the end magnezone probably the most playable prime overall just for his splash ability in general just like ridiculous value that he would gain not only from drawing cards but also taking big one hit ko's that wasn't all that easy in this format otherwise so yeah magnezone just a crazy card definitely Next up, we have the other big aspect of the HGSS era, which was Legend Pokemon. Uh, most of these really were not playable. Some, I think a few of them saw very niche play. The only ones that really saw a lot of play was RDL, Rayquaza, and Deoxys Legend. Um, and that's the one we've chosen. It's easily the most iconic. It's It was the one that people recognized in decks. It was played competitively. It actually uh, was very, very good in Magnezone decks, which was pretty cool. Uh, so it would be cool if they kind of... Uh, paired these two off together it would be I, I don't think we're likely to get a legend pokemon but this would definitely be our pick if we were to uh but i think all of these the, these arts were kind of the first thing we'd ever seen like this um typically a lot of arts to up to this point uh had stayed within like the the boxes the confined to the boxes that they were usually drawn in this was these were kind of the first ever real full art cards uh and you we've never seen artwork like this really i don't think even even since with like some of the alt arts and stuff i still think some of them don't even scratch the surface on how good legend pokemon looked so i don't think it'll ever happen but i would really love to see a reprint of rdl in the collector set personally next up we're going on to full art trainers full arts were introduced in the black and white set and uh carried on all the way through the sun and moon sets as well and is carrying on even today uh we've gone with n being the poster boy of pretty much the TCG, twice over. Uh, he's been in our format and he's just been remarkable every time. 
he's pretty much known as like the healthiest best card ever and really does help the prizing mechanic of Pokemon be more balanced for giving players the chance to actually come back, even if they had slow, uh, slow starts. Or you can uh, navigate game plans around making your opponent at some point in the game have a low hand size and then can't mount a comeback. So it makes the game much more positional in terms of board state rather than exactly how many prizes both players have. So everyone kind of wants this guy back. And I think even from an art style, always looking great. There's some debate whether you would prefer this one or the reprint that we got from the best of XY. Uh, oh, sorry, the best of black and white, I think it was. Can't remember. No, I think it was the it best was of XY. XY. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it was reprinted, right? Uh, yeah. But either way, I'd be happy with either. Uh, there's been some yeah. incredible supporters that we've had throughout the years. And, you know, shout out to Cynthia as well, being one of the most popular um, supporters out there as well. A ton of waifu cards have gone up in value recently. So there's obviously demand <laughs> around those. Trump card, obviously a banned card, uh, because yeah. he was, again, equally uh, sort of game-breaking and how he changed up the format. Obviously, he ended in kind of a bad rap where everyone was just going down a Shaman Toad route, but pre that archetype, we had some really cool decks uh, being formed where you could just cycle aggressively. It meant that most people were getting what they wanted to do every turn done, which made some crazy wombo combos happen. So that was also a really cool time to play the TCG. It was very different to most eras of Pokemon. Definitely. Next up, we have EX Pokemon. This is the... Uh, again, the ones that started in the uh, black and white era and went all the way through to the uh, end of X and Y. Uh, we picked Mewtwo because Mewtwo is Mewtwo, but also it was the first reprinted EX Pokemon when they reintroduced the mechanic. Uh, the art is absolutely fantastic. This card was absolutely meta-dividing. The phrase Mewtwo Wars come like was born uh, because of this card, and it, it didn't go away until Mewtwo rotated. Um yeah, this card was obviously absolutely insane. It's one of the most iconic Pokemon cards of all time, I think, especially of the modern era. Uh, if you consider sort of black, uh, well, yeah, black and white onwards, the modern era. I think it's one of the poster boys. Everyone knows what Mewtwo did. Everyone knows how good Mewtwo was. Uh, yeah, it was completely meta warping. But this was such a hard category to break down. We had such a difficult time uh, picking just some iconic Pokemon th to fill this slide. I think you could justify probably nearly upwards of 10 Pokemon could take yeah. the cake here. Um, it just happens to be that we, one, haven't really had a Mewtwo yet, and two, uh, for us at the time, Mewtwo was just so impactful. Uh, for us personally, Mewtwo is definitely the most iconic one, but I think I, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be unhappy with 10, 11, maybe even 12 different EX Pokemon on this slide, just because uh, th this era was so defining for the game. Uh, you know, single prize X basically didn't really exist for a while just because these EXs were so, so good. Um, and yeah, it's, it felt like every set they re they printed one, uh, it was just nuts. It wasn't, and it wasn't even like they printed one and every set they just printed one new one. It felt like we were getting three or four new fantastically playable EXs per set as well, uh, especially in the first few C uh, sets that these were released in. So yeah, really difficult to... Uh, pick because these spanned across two generations but the poster boy the one that kicked everything off uh the one that began the mewtwo wars uh mewtwo <laughs> ex is definitely i think a very deserving pick uh next up we have a specs i'm pretty sure they won't print a specs but it could give uh the pokemon company a good opportunity to actually reprint comp search or dowsing machine uh for <laughs> expanded players if they made these reprints playable uh for people it could uh allow newer players to have an easier entry point to the expanded format which i think would actually be a really good tactical move for pokemon so obviously <laughs> people don't want this from a collector standpoint too much but giving <laughs> us comp search and dowsing would be really really a smart move uh for the expanded player base especially in america of course but if they were to bring it over to europe as well and other regions uh it would be a big thumbs up from us Definitely. Next up, we have Plasma Pokemon, kind of uh, uh, similarly to how SPs were separate from level Xs. We have uh, separated Plasma Pokemon out because there were a couple of uh, highlight Plasma Pokemon that weren't EXs. We have, of course, picked Genesect EX. Uh, I think there were many, again, many good picks here. But Genesect EX, Plasma Genesect, kind of defined a whole archetype and was an insanely good card. It built its own deck. It was... Uh, pretty meta warping, but even just some of the first plasma cards, uh, the four nominations were all uh, kind of in a deck together at one point. Uh, at least three of them were, and you know you could never. Lugia had its own archetype, 
just being such an efficient attacker, taking extra prizes. So all of these were very, very competitive. Not overly... Uh, there, there wasn't. They didn't have amazing art. I think the Lugia is the only one that has really, really good art, personally, in my opinion. Um, but for their competitive viability, all of these were uh, very, very strong. And the arts were definitely unique as well. There's, It's very rare that we see a whole mechanic kind of... Um, focused around one art style and it, this the whole blue borders and blue lightning around all of these cards that kind of thing uh, we'd never really seen anything like that artwork wise before so these were definitely uh somewhat meta defining competitively uh, but also uh, kind of a landmark in design uh, which is pretty cool so yeah it would be really cool for them to hark to the plasma pokemon especially as we kind of see battle styles and single strike and rapid strike which is pretty much a very similar thing in all fairness uh, these days so i feel like there would be a lot of people that could relate to these cars that maybe didn't even play uh back in the plasma era next up we have the mega pokemon mechanic uh, we've once gone, gone with uh rayquaza i think it breaches that a split between obviously being a very uh dynamic deck that had a lot of results and was played in multiple eras of pokemon but also does cater to those collectors you know if it was me and jack picking this list uh on our own personal biases we'd pick gardevoir in a heartbeat uh, yep. Medrodino as well obviously had that highlight in Worlds, but what didn't really have the longevity that Rayquaza did in its various different forms. It went through all sorts of different iterations of different type coverages uh, in a, in the back to sort of support it. Uh, you know, there were straight builds, there were metal, water, dark builds, all sorts of different ways you could play Rayquaza uh, throughout its lifespan. So really, really solid card. It also, alongside Skyfield, helped sort of break another game state. So there is that sort of landmark element that you do attribute to Rayquaza so often. Uh, by having that massive bench. And of course, that's come back reiterated with um, Eternatus more recently as well. So like you said, uh, with the Plasma Pokemon, this could be a way for people to tap into that older era of Pokemon if they are one of the newer uh, collectors out there. Definitely. Next up, we have Break, Mo uh, Break Pokemon, a mechanic that was um, only around for a year or so, but definitely uh, kind of a really interesting one. This was a time where we had some good evolutions, but like I say, EXs were still very strong. Uh, so you wouldn't really think that breaks would work, stage 3 Pokemon in certain circumstances. And honestly, most of them didn't, but Greninja Break definitely did. Greninja is, I think, one of the most iconic decks of all time, uh, for how much people hated it more than anything, to be honest. Um, there's, there's, there was, there's a lot of um, sort of history to Greninja as well, how it... Uh, you know, it, it never seemed to be the play. It never seemed to be a particularly good time for Greninja, but still, it always found a way. Uh, it Greninja itself had like three or four different mechanics within the deck. It had sniping, it had ability lock, it had water duplicates, which was, uh, I think, the first time we ever saw an attack like that, or definitely one of the most, uh, one of the best attacks like that we'd ever seen. So, yeah, it really kind of was a very, very unique deck, and I think by far the best break Pokemon out there. A couple of really... Uh, notable shoutouts to be fair though things like uh trevenant and uh xerneas did see competitive success uh, similarly to zoroark and yuvaltol but i think nothing really uh scratches greninja's uh you know longevity and infamacy within the uh, within the game and the way to be able to kind of tie it all together was with the break pokemon uh so yeah we decided m maybe for better maybe for worse that greninja <laughs> uh break was the best break pokemon or the most iconic at least what I love is even like five years later, if I pull this card, it will still make me like actually angry. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have GX Pokemon moving into uh, the Sun and Moon era, of course. Uh, you do have to mention Lele uh, and Dedenne. The reason why we couldn't pick one of these as a winner is they've both sort of taken the mantle over each other. So they've both sort of had half and half of the GX era. So we felt that Zoroark, you know, he was so defining and warped the entire game around him. Some of uh, Pokemon players' favorite time to ever play the TCG was around this sort of era because players who were using Zoroark, if you got those turn one Bridgets and actually got into the game, you had so much control over the tempo, the pace. You could play all sorts of different ways of Zoroark, of course. It was able to um, find different successful builds all over the place. Really, really amazing card all round. 
maybe some argument for God of War. Of course, it had that world's win as soon as it burst onto the scene and then managed to uh, pair itself with Zoroark, pair itself with Swampert even, and Ninetales and that sort of stuff. So also a very versatile card that could cheat in its own right with things like Twilight GX being crazy and Secret Spring being ridiculous at energy acceleration. But overall, Zoroark, you know, it was never going to die. It was such a r ridiculous card. And, you know, it also has that huge tie towards Tord, one of the best modern players of all time. And I think giving the nod to Zoroark is also, uh, for a player standpoint, giving a nod to... Uh, him and his sort of history in the game as well. So I think that would be a really worthy inclusion, I think. Definitely. Next up, we have Ultra Beasts. Again, kind of a smaller mechanic, uh, more, more limited mechanic, but a mechanic nonetheless. There were cards that specifically related to Ultra Beasts, things like Beast Ring uh, and a couple of GX attacks that really targeted Ultra Beasts. Uh, this was kind of a weird one because we actually had a lot of nominations for this because some of the Ultra Beasts were crazy. The one we went with, though, is uh, Baby Buzzwall. This card, for its time, was absolutely magnificent. It was one of the... It was at a time when Zoroark was very, very good anyway, so naturally having weakness on one of the most versatile cards, the, the most iconic GX Pokemon, actually, uh, was great. But Sledgehammer kind of forcing your opponent to have to play differently to not get this huge tempo attack for one energy on a one-prize Pokemon uh, actually ended up kind of defining multiple archetypes. It meant that People always try to find ways to uh, uh, not only just dodge Beast Ring now, but be specifically dodge that full prize turn. Um, you know, it was played as a tech card in basically every single deck. Um, it, well, it could be because we had Rainbow Energy at the time, so, uh, you know, it could just easily be splashed in. But it also made its own archetype. Uh, Zap Beasts, we had the sort of Buzzwall Garbodor era. Um you know, there was, there was a lot of very, very strong decks that it got even stronger just by being able to play one Buzzwall and a couple of Rainbow Energy, and all of a sudden you were able to just do a 120 poke, uh, sometimes taking two prizes, but even just a 120 poke on an attacker that you really didn't care about was amazing. So yeah, definitely one of the most ultra def uh, one of the most defining Ultra Beasts. Uh, it was very difficult to pick between, I think for us at least, Buzzwall, Baby Buzzwall and Buzzwall GX, but there is argument for Baby Placephalon as well, I think the card probably uh, has frustrated people, maybe at this point even more than Greninja did, um, just from being it being so efficient and having an unlimited damage cap in a time where uh, things like tag teams were out, where you end up taking three prizes on a one prize Pokemon. Um, usually, th these kind of things are what people like. They like to be able to compete with one prize decks, but I think um Bercephalon really broke the mold in that and a lot of people really don't like the card which is quite kind of makes it iconic in its own right uh and then Bercephalon and Naganadel kind of again built its own deck um Blown GX was very very competitive at the time and kind of never really died even even until it rotated so yeah uh for such a small category it was very very difficult to pick this uh winner and definitely the nominations uh, but we think Buzzwall just is so iconic for its time uh that it definitely deserves the reprint Next up, we have Prism Star Pokemon. We kept just a Pokemon for this category. There obviously are some infamous stadium cards and even some supporter cards that you could consider. Um, but we think, you know, for that collector front, people would more likely prefer to have Pokemon to be pulled in these sorts of spaces. And we think Coco Prism Star just has some of the most ridiculous energy acceleration we've ever seen. Like, it's actually just so ridiculous. The amount of value one card gets you that's an easily searchable basic Pokemon it found its way into all sorts of decks. It's justifiable in, you know, even decks that splash in like three to four lightning energy just for that extra burst of attachments. We saw so many like double colorless energy style attackers go with whatever uh, double colorless style cards you could play and then a number of basic energy just because there'd be a point in the game where you could Coco then turn attach a basic lightning and get yourself there. So we think that's easily the most um, iconic. I think Ditto Prism style would probably be our closest second because... They brought about such a healthy ability and made us have that option to have such great splashable tech cards into all sorts of decks, be it for like type coverage or um, techs for certain matchups. It was an excellent card to have in the game and really opened up the doors for some extra creativity all over the place. And just the one ditto made that so much more justifiable in terms of deck space. It almost allowed you to cheat deck space in so many different uh archetypes which was just such an amazing thing for the game and i'd love the sort of design to come back into the game at some point or another 
Uh, a lot of people are looking at, out for the next Ditto card because I think this was such a <laughs> roaring success that we'd love to see another one uh, like this again soon in the game. So we'd love to see that ability come back. Wouldn't quite like to see Coco ability come back anytime soon because it really is able to build so many decks around him because he's just so ridiculous. Yeah. Next up, we have tag teams. This was a controversial one because a lot of people don't like tag teams. But if they're going to hark back to every different era of the Pokemon uh, trading card game, you can't ignore tag team Pokemon. Uh, the other big controversy here is probably the fact that we don't have ADP as our winner. Um, ADP is obviously it's meta defining. There is a huge sort of uh, cult following for and against ADP. But it all started with Picarom, and until recently, Picarom has basically never, ever been bad. And even now, it's not bad, it's just adapted to playing Mewtwo and Mew to, for type coverage. Um, I think this is, I think Picarom is one of the only cards, other than things like uh, Mewtwo EX and Uvolto EX, that has always been good in its tenure in the TCG. Um, it's always been at least like tier two, usually in all fairness. After a format's settled down, it's found itself in Tier 1. I can't think of many times when this wasn't a Tier 1 archetype. Um, it's constantly adapting. It's gone from hyper-aggressive to hyper-defensive to somewhere in the middle. It's We've had Mewtwo builds based around Picaron. We've had Picaron builds based around, based around Mewtwo. You know, it was the first ever tag team. Uh, it's a Pikachu. We haven't got a Pikachu on this list as well. Uh, so, yeah, it's just absolutely meta-defining. It's very, very memorable. And as the first of an archetype that not many people like, but is definitely notable in the game, uh, we couldn't really say no to Picarom. You can see on this list, though, it was a very difficult choice. Uh, I think especially between ADP, Picarom, Mewtwo, and Reshizard, but uh, Garchomp Giratina gets on the list as well just for that fantastic art, as well as being <laughs> very playable for um, a fairly long period of time, in all fairness. Uh, but yeah, this actually was a really difficult category to nail down as well. Uh, but yeah, Picarom, I think you can't really argue with it. It's one of the best cards of all time. Into the V era then. Obviously, we're still in this era, but I think you can already tip your cap to Zation. I think he's already proven uh, quite clearly how ridiculous this card is from a playability standpoint. Intrepid Sword, without the text of Brave Blade, has made Zation see a ton of play in some of the strongest decks in the game, uh, just for the card generation that he can provide is just ridiculous and entire archetypes have been built around that where you can just accumulate resources but when you combine this attacking presence it's been the basis of a couple of some of the strongest decks in the game uh, the defensive luke metal approach and the aggressive adp approach there's also been like temposation in there as well when we had jirachi prism star uh, mr mime which i think was really cool there's just so many ways you can see zation uh, work and uh, even to this day, it's seeing a lot of play. Uh, really, really strong card. Um, obviously, it's a poster boy of um, Sword and Shield as well. So there is that collector base there that you could harp back on as well. So that's by far and away the most iconic V Pokemon we've seen so far. Definitely. On to the VMAXs. And this is a really weird one. I think uh, because we're so early into the VMAX era and there's probably been more playable Vs than VMAXs, it was weird to call one of these iconic as of yet, but... Uh, we wanted to include them anyway, and Eternatus was definitely our pick. I think under normal circumstances, we would have a single strike and rapid strike section, and I think Urshifu VMAX would definitely take that, at least given what we know currently. Um, but I think for the regular VMAXs, Eternatus is the one that sticks out to uh, most people. Obviously, it felt like this was the first VMAX that really broke the game. Uh, we had a couple of sets of VMAXs prior, but and obviously things like Dragapult were good, but they never felt game-breaking. They were just very, very efficient. But Eternatus broke the game. It let you have up to eight bench Pokemon, similarly to Skyfield, which is definitely, uh, especially for newer players, probably the first time I've ever seen this. For more experienced players, they may kind of think this is a bit of a cop-out, especially as we already have Mega Ray on the list. <laughs> uh, but I think there hasn't been another VMAX other than maybe Rapid Strike Urshifu and now Calyrex uh, that is as iconic. And it felt weird giving it to Calyrex, given that it's only been out for two weeks. Um, and Urshifu, even though it's only been out for three months, it still felt a, a bit weird giving it to it. So I think Eternatus is definitely the one. Plus, it's uh, it's Eternatus. It's the big bad of uh, Gen 8, and it's the only Eternamax Pokemon. Whether that will ever change, we don't know, but um, <laughs> definitely there's sort of intricacies to its um, VMAX form as well. So yeah, really weird, really weird one to pick, especially given that we're still in this era, a bit like the Zacian one. Uh, but I think Eternatus 
is just one of those Pokemon that will never really be forgotten because of uh, how much it changed the meta game. Next up, we have Amazing Res again, kind of a uh, more modern thing. And we know that most of these haven't had much playability out of some great highlight reel YouTube videos. Uh, but we're going with Jirachi here. Uh, Jirachi, a really iconic Pokemon for collectors. It's some of the better artwork, I think, personally. Uh, and it has that little edge over the others in a slight bit of hope for playability as well. Um, it's obviously being overshadowed right now by other Jirachis, um, but maybe there'll be a day where we actually have to use Dreamy Revelation as some of us set up. So yeah, Jirachi is going to take uh, the amazing rare slot. And that's it. That's every mechanic that we could think of in terms of their most well, the most iconic iconic Pokemon for each mechanic. Obviously, there's plenty more iconic Pokemon out there. Uh, you can see four right here that have all seen play, but there's there's hundreds of Pokemon we could have. If we were just looking at iconic Pokemon in general, and if that's something you'd like to see, let us know. Uh, we really enjoyed making this video. We had a lot of internal debate, uh, a lot of sort of discussion about where we think some of these cards landed, which was great. Uh, it was really enjoyable to kind of reminisce for some of the decks. I mean, Joe and I have been playing Vinity 12 years now, so it was nice to go back and think about some of these different archetypes that um, we maybe haven't looked at for a little while. So... Yeah, we would love to do something similar if you guys would be interested, maybe looking at each era, maybe each generation and some of the more uh, niche iconic Pokemon that weren't tied to a mechanic. Uh, you can see four here uh, that would definitely make their respective lists. Uh, so yeah, it would definitely be a really interesting one to look into more. Um, I really hope we see some of the cards we've picked today in the Celebration set. I'm not usually one for collector sets, but I'm really excited about Celebrations and what uh, sort, sort of the nostalgia that's going to be tied to it. So... Uh, it's going to be really, really good. Yeah, really excited. Thanks for watching, guys. Let us know uh, if you would have anything else on your list or if you would pick another of our nominees. Um, hope you enjoy, and we'll be back with more content tomorrow. Cheers.